Um, so we start uh, with the first speaker, who is Hank Buchstra, a colleague of mine in Leiden. Hank is a professor of cosmology at the Leiden Observatory and uh, also one of the cosmology coordinator of um, the mission uh, Euclid. So he will uh, um, tell us all about this exciting and upcoming cosmological mission. And I think I leave the floor to you. 35 minutes is plus questions. Okay, thanks, and it's great to be here again, because uh, I studied here in Groningen, and it's always a pleasure to come back. Um, also, the surroundings here have changed a lot since uh, the last time I was here. Um, yeah, and I'm going to start the, the conference by talking about uh, Euclid. Good. Um, and, and yeah, sort of give you uh, a sense of why uh, this might be the ultimate cosmology mission, because I think it has great potential to, to really advance our knowledge of cosmology to the point where um, we'll actually end up in interesting situation and how to proceed. Um, okay, so, and, and, and in a way, in a cosmology, we ran in a very interesting time, because of course, cosmology has always been very important in, in sort of trying to make sense of the world around us. And of course, in the past, in the absence of knowledge, so to say, we projected our own ideal world on the cosmos. But since the scientific revolution, we sort of reversed the progress, the process, and basically take knowledge and, and turn that knowledge into a worldview. And of course, um, that uh, has led to a very strange universe. Um, but we're also in a very special situation because this is a universe we now pretty much know, a universe full of dark matter, dark energy, and a little bit of stuff that we sort of feel comfortable with, the Debarians. And this implies that there is new physics. So a very different universe. And, and this new physics says something about the current model. We know that it is not the true model of the universe because there's unexplained stuff. So some people even call it, we're now in an era of maximum ignorance because previously we just didn't know. And this is one of the few cases where we absolutely sure that despite the successes of CERN, the model that they've been testing there is not the true model of the universe. And so really what should we then do? Right? So, so um, we know we're ignorant about the true model of the universe, and we can say, okay, let's ignore it, right? It's a common uh, thing to do these days in, in society. If you don't like the outcome, you just ignore it. But of course, we're scientists, and we don't have that choice. We have to figure out how to get more knowledge, because the knowledge will help us reduce our ignorance. And so basically what that means, we need better measurements. Um, and, and I added an asterisk there because in this case, um, we need to improve things. What I mean better, it means a lot more data, an order of magnitude more. So we really need to shrink the statistical uncertainties. But at the same time, what we're after, the, the nature of dark energy is very subtle. And so it's not just enough to get a lot of data, but better also means that the quality of the data has to improve. And so that poses a challenge for an observational cosmologist like myself, because then the question is, okay, we have a problem. We want to study it. We have an idea that we need to get a lot more data, better data, but what exactly, what kind of data do we need? And this is where our ignorance comes to bite us, right? Because if we know what we're after, we can design an experiment. Right now we, yeah, have only vague notion of dark matter, but we have yet to detect dark matter. Is it a particle? Is it modified gravity, gravity theory? Uh, the situation for dark energy is arguably even worse. Right? So we're in a situation where we know we have an incorrect model and we have to base our observational, the next observational steps on a model effectively that we know is incorrect. 
And so that this piece of wisdom is in, uh, catches that, that, that very well. But we do have some idea. We, we do know, in a way, arguably it's more by process of elimination. We know which things won't help us much. And so that leaves us sort of homing in on, on a series of sort of things in the universe that, that we can study, should study to address the, the question about the dark side of the universe. So we need things that are sensitive to dark energy, dark matter and, and, and gravity. So that's one thing, so you need to have the sensitivity obviously, but they also need to be able to be measured and, and in measurement, I also mean interpreted reliably. And of course the CMB has been a great success and that features many of these aspects, but it doesn't tell us much about dark energy because it's probing the high redshift universe. And so really probing the low redshift universe where dark energy is becoming important is to look at the expansion history. So there's basically what, what the supernova discovery led to, right? So you look at how, how fast is the universe expanding that led to the discovery of accelerated expansion. Um, and the other part is to see how structure grows. And that's really where most of the development is these days, because that allows us to test also the gravity part uh, and the dark matter part, because the expansion history is limited in, in what kind of information it can bring. And that's sort of clear from this picture here, just a, a cosmological simulation that shows how structure forms as the universe expands. And, and you can do this for different types of condition, conditions. And these, these, these evolutionary sequences, the statistics of, of the structure you see will subtly be different when you change the cosmological model. And so we can then test whether the problem is here in the theory of gravity, or if the problem is here uh, in the energy density or whether additional terms are needed. Because any changes to these equations that describe the evolution of gravity in an expanding universe will lead to observational effects. And so coming back to what we want to design is we want a study that basically has high precision because the effects are subtle. So we need a lot of data. So we need many, many, many uh, objects. So we want a large survey. But, and I think this is important, we also need high accuracy, as I mentioned before. So that means we need small biases. So it's not enough to just get a lot of data. We need also data that we understand very well. And also something uh, for uh, really two reasons is that we want not to rely on a single probe because although we make uh, convince ourselves that the biases are small, how do we know? The only way to know is to compare to another independent measurement. So you want consistency, so you need at least two probes. But also, if you're really brave, you want to combine them. And ideally, they'll be complementary and actually improve your measurements. And so that additionally, right, and this is sort of where the, the, the supernovae can do a lot of this, except that you can complement something, but it's not sensitive to the gravity. And so that's why you need to consider probes that also can test really a broad range of the paradigm because after all, we don't know where there is a cat running around here. And so if we, we then zoom in a little bit more, if we can make it a bit more precise, what is it that we, what, what we want to study? So what, I, I showed this, this, this structure forming in this expanding universe. Um, right, and I, and I said, look, if that, that, how that progresses depends on the underlying cosmological model. So we wanna see the change in that evolution. So we don't wanna just pick one single redshift, one single distance and say, oh, this is the, this is the structure, but we want to trace it over cosmic time. So we wanna study evolution. Dark energy has become dominant, as far as we know, at low redshift, so that sort of, then says which redshift range we should probe. So this is where the CMB sort of drops out. Um, and when you look at this equation, Einstein's equations, there's sort of two potentials, a time-like and a space-like, which we usually, uh, well, in basic GR, they're equal, um, but you would like to distinguish between those and test that specific assumption. And that, because that's where modified gravity theories tend to differ. 
And so that then leads to a very specific design specification. We need redshift information, we need distances, otherwise we can't do evolution. Uh, the optimal redshift range is sort of the semi nearby universe up to redshift two. And we need, again, at least two probes because there's two potentials that we want to decouple and one should be relativistic. And so that brings us down really, if you look at all possible cosmological probes, then the turnout that uh, to study the structure, our choices are limited. The most obvious one is to just look at a sky and you see the structure in the distribution of galaxies. Shown here, a picture of Sloan, you can see the, the structure, but of course it doesn't go all the way to redshift two, but you can expand this. So that's actually a very simple approach. You just measure the distances to galaxies uh, you measure redshift, you measure positions, you do it for a ton of galaxies, there you have your, your big survey. But then it gets trickier, and this is the hard part, is where you need to figure out your angular completeness, like, because if your depth varies, and that's the, typically the case when you do this from the ground, um, you have to model this, because you might confuse atmospheric variations with cosmological variations. Um, and so that's really difficult, um, but it's of course a, a, a more profound one because who, how do we know that these galaxies trace the matter field? Because that's ultimately what was in that simulation. How do they trace the matter field faithfully? And we know that that's not quite the case. On large scales, statistically they do, but when we go to smallest cases, <clears throat> additional effects play a role. And that brings me to uh, the, the second probe, the one I spend most of my time working on, namely weak gravitational lensing, because density fluctuations between us and, and the distant galaxies, they perturb spacetime. And as a result, uh, we, we see coherent distortions in the shapes of galaxies. And we can measure this. And we can use this, it's like when you walk in an old building and you have this glass that have various thickness, you see a distorted view of the world outside or inside if you look from the outside in and we see the same when we look at the universe we see a universe that everything has been displaced and slightly stretched but these stretches form coherent patterns and these coherent patterns we can use to actually figure out what the distribution of dark matter is and here are some very famous examples of merging clusters where it's clear that the dark matter is displaced uh, from most of the baryons And if we do this now as a function of, of distance to the sources, because these sources, the sources, the effect is cumulative. And so we need to slice the universe in a, in a specific way, but that allows us to actually trace the evolution of the distribution of dark matter directly without having making assumptions whether or not galaxies trace the underlying dark matter distribution. So this is extremely powerful and this weak gravitational lensing is arguably the best probe to study dark energy. And the amount, and this is really exciting, the amount of data has been increasing exponentially uh, since I finished my PhD uh, here in Groningen in 2000. And in dark are, the, are the, the, the projects I've been involved in. And what you see here is that the amount of data, so the information here captured by signal to noise ratio of just the lensing measurement has been increasing exponentially. And this sort of brings me to a first uh, point about the title of the talk, because of course you can extrapolate this, but of course there's a problem as you can experience here in this dome, there's only so much area on the sky. And these surveys here, and yeah, you can see it very nicely, this is a problem. This Milky Way, very pretty here takes out about a third of the extragalactic sky. So that we can't look at because you just can't look through here. And then there's less relevant necessarily is, is, is the, the, the plane where the planets uh, move with. There's a lot of dust so from space that is sort of out. But these surveys, Euclid and LSST, effectively are exhausting the available sky. So we can't extrapolate this much further. So we need to think a bit harder because we're soon going to run out of information. So that's in the sense where we're sort of reaching the ultimate. We can't do much, much better. 
Similarly, and this brings me back to the, the point of accuracy. So the information content has been increasing exponentially. So you would expect that to be reflected in the uncertainties on cosmological parameters. This shows the uncertainties on the clumpiness in the universe, uh, which is what lensing measures best. And you see over time that, yeah, things have improved, but the difference between these error bars and these error bars, that's by no means exponential improvement. And that's because in part, these surveys were not designed to do the measurements. So we took existing telescopes and, and, and improved things. A little bit different for kids, that telescope was designed to do this. But also, as we moved along, we learned a lot more, basically realized that we we're very, well, you could call it ignorant or brave or naive, uh, whatever you want, um, early on. But as we moved on, we managed to also improve our understanding, reduce the biases. And I really believe that we're now in a, at a stage where we understand the probe really, really well, and that these error bars are going to shrink. But of course, that it, nonetheless, it, that puts the floor, right? So we're running out of sky. Um, this, we're discovering all kinds of systematics that ultimately can limit the, the, the accuracy as well. And so the next step is then to say, okay, what if we then combine probe? And, and this plot, uh, recent result from the kilo degree survey shows really how beneficial it is to compare these, these lensing measurements, which are here, these big contours. So this is again, this clumpiness. So you see, that's what we, this direction we measure things very well. And then once we combine with clustering measurements, the mean density of the universe is constrained also much, much better. All right, so you see how probe combination can be extremely helpful. And so this is then leads us to the design of Euclid because Euclid is designed to do just that. So we go to space, because then we can measure these wretches very, very well in the near infrared. So we don't have these issues with, with the, the, the sky, the, the atmosphere interfering. And also the lack of atmosphere helps us measuring shapes uh, much, much better. And so with Euclid, we'll image a third of the sky. Uh, so where is it? Yeah, so, so the most of it in the south. So pretty much anywhere here where it's dark and where there are no planets, that's what we'll look at. And the resolution is similar to the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's gonna be phenomenal. So I can't wait to project the full Euclid at full resolution here some, sometime in the future. But unfortunately, we'll have to wait a little bit. But we aim to measure about 2 billion galaxies, which is a major step up compared to the sort of tens of millions we're doing now. And so, as I said, it, it'll really produce a high definition view of a third of the sky. And to do that, yeah, we use this pretty large camera. You don't, can't put it in your pocket anymore. Um, but to, to highlight what, how big the improvement is, this is a single exposure with a Hubble Space Telescope. A single Euclid exposure looks like this. However, it should never show the moon in any of the pictures because we're flying at L2 to ensure a stable thermal environment. If we see the moon, that means we're pointing at the sun. And so that would be disastrous. So this is just for reference. But the point is we observe an enormous, a much larger, more than 100 times more of sky every time we open the shutter compared to the Hubble Space Telescope. And we do this for six years. So these, all these beautiful pictures from Hubble that you may have seen, which Hubble took over a span of about 30 years, that takes Euclid a couple of days. And then we continue for six years. So, so you can imagine that the discovery potential is, is tremendous. And just to give you a flavor, as I said, Euclid is similar to, to, um, to Hubble. And so we can compare the, the deepest ground-based data to Hubble data. So this is a picture of Subaru, which is a, reflects actually as a good representation of uh, the Rubin large, uh, of the legacy, the large survey of space and time, LSST. And so this is basically what LSST would see. And this is what, what uh, Euclid will see in the same sky. So go back and forth and you can see, so I hope, you notice the improvement. And, and, and it's always hard to see, but actually, even though LSD or, or Subaru in this case are extremely deep, 
when you look carefully, when you zoom in, you detect almost every object also in the Euclid images. So Euclid is both sharp, but also actually quite deep. And we'll also have a couple of deep fields that go much, much, much fainter. And so right now it's, it's sort of strange times because we're almost ready for launch. Actually, we're undergoing the final testing. Um, and actually, yeah, in the, in the next few weeks, it in principle would be sent off for launch. But the launch uh, was initially uh, on a Soyuz rocket, but of course, because of the war in Ukraine, um, we lost our launcher. And so that's now main, the main uh, problem. We need a rocket. We have a satellite. It's gonna do amazing stuff, but we need a launcher. And, and so the launch date is, is quite uncertain. Um, we're exploring all kinds of options. So it may still be next year, um, maybe end of 2024. Uh, but later will be will be problematic because there's other projects like LSST, but also the Roman Space Telescope in the US that will be launching at around 2027. So we're getting more and more competitors, whereas we're in the unique position to launch a space telescope that is ahead of the competing ground-based projects. So that's Euclid in a nutshell and, and why it's designed the same way. So that's great. So we launch it. And then what we do, do we do? Because in a way, it's a lot of potential information if we focus on that. But at the analysis that we need to do, we're coming back to sort of the same precision, it's not the same of accuracy. We have to pretty much revisit everything we've done in cosmology, right? Because you want to compare models to the observations and it's sort of the standard way, but is it really a Gaussian likelihood? Uh, actually, we know it's not quite, probably okay. Um, the data factor is what we focus on most, right? Just making sure we get good, the data we need, sharp shapes, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a challenge. Um, the covariance itself, usually that's something you ignore, but in this case, the covariance is, is a nightmare um, because he, once your errors get very small, you have to make sure you actually get them right and also get the correlations between probes. And then on the theory vector where our chair has been doing a lot of work, um, how do new physical models give rise to new, new vectors that we can compare? So there's a lot of things to explore, but there's also more mundane astrophysical effects that need to be explored in that. So focus on the data. So we're launching to space. Everything is great, except space is a horrible place to put a camera, but there's a lot of radiation and over time, all these, these energetic particles slowly destroy our camera and we need to account for this because we're trying to measure things at ridiculous accuracy. And so this is an exaggerated simulated image where you see cosmic rays that we need to account for and actually correct for, but also the radiation damage causes a sort of trails between all objects. And of course, we're trying to measure shapes. If every galaxy has a little tail that changes their shapes, it causes biases that we need to deal with. So there's a lot of work going on to calibrate things. So that in that sense, Euclid is also probably the most calibrated telescope in space. We spent actually a significant amount of time making sure we understand the, the instrument. And there's things we're really digging into now, the, the blending of objects, because galaxies do not, well, it would be great if they were nice circles and if they would be lying nicely on a grid, of course, then there would be no cosmic structure. So that would be a problem, but from a measurement perspective, that would be ideal, but in reality, Galaxies overlap, which is all very complicated. So we need to account for that as well. And as I said, that is not enough. If we just take the weak lensing, which in principle is the, the, one of the best probes available by itself is not enough to really get sub percent measurements of the dark energy equation of state. We need to do even better than that. And that's where this probe combination comes back. And this is from uh, an overview paper where uh, the Euclid team looked at basically how well can we constrain cosmological parameters. And, and the important thing is to compare sort of these, these bright colors to in the end uh, are the, the blue and purple to the orange and yellow. And you see that those constraints improve dramatically when you compare lensing and galaxy clustering to the orange, but even more when you also include the cross correlations. 
So you have all this combination of galaxies, matter, uh, autocorrelations, and galaxy matter cross correlations. And once you combine that information, you really shrink the, the constraint. So you, there you see the complementarity of the probe, just like what we saw before. But in the case of Euclid, it's of course a step beyond that. But there's a big but because that implicitly assumes when we do this comparison that we understand how galaxies statistically populate dark matter halos. And so how well do we know this? How do they interact with their environment? So now the problem becomes also a galaxy formation problem. And so something we, we showed about 10 years ago is that the baryons matter because on small scales, because the, the smaller scales we can probe, the, the, the better we can measure things. And, and on these small scales, feedback processes during galaxy formation, redistributed baryons, and that is notoriously hard to predict because that depends on, all, on star formation, AGN feedback. And, and in fact, most of the baryons remain largely unaccounted for. Right? So we know there's so many baryons, but exactly where they are, we don't really know because most of them in, are in hot uh, diffuse uh, phases. But the fact that they are redistributed has a huge impact on the models that, that people were using for cosmological analysis because they were based on pure and body simulation. They implicitly assumed that the atoms faithfully trace the distribution of dark matter. But we know that it's not the case. And hydro simulations are therefore playing a, a, an ever more important role. And, and, and here's the problem in a sort of graphic way, two simulations from the, the Eagle set, uh, one with feedback, the other without. And sort of you see that when you look at just the positions of these galaxies, things look very similar, right? This, this spot, this galaxy, same location. This one, yeah, looks pretty much the same. So you can sort of see if you correlate the shapes of these big galaxies on large scales, um, because this is several megaparsecs, that looks pretty much the same. But then if you look more carefully, you see that when you look at a distributed gas particles, that the feedback processes really blow out a lot of that gas. And even though the barons make up only 5%, if you blow out maybe half of that, so your uncertainty in the model is half of the barons are unaccounted for, that overwhelms the subtle effects that dark energy has on the evolution of matter, right? So the effect of dark energy, even though dark energy is in, a, in the budget sense, far more important, its impact on cosmology is, is quite small. And so these problems, the astrophysics, so to say, on large scale, we can capture statistically. And so there we can do cosmology, whereas on very small scales, it's mostly studying astrophysical processes uh, almost irrespective of the cosmological model. But there's, of course, a big range of several megaparsecs in between where there's a lot of information available to be extracted. And that is really, I think, where Euclid itself can play a key role in probing that. Because Euclid has very sharp images, actually, uh, I received a grant to, to focus on a particular aspect to basically focus on very small scale weak gravitational lensing measurements. And, and we believe that with Euclid and some additional image processing that we can measure the average mass in stars of galaxies directly. So we measure exactly what, what, what simulations predict. And we can do this for any kind of subset of galaxies and that will really put very important constraints on these models. So really on small scales, we can measure directly the conversion of gas to stars. On somewhat larger scales, we can also look at the scaling relation between baryonic trace and see, are they consistent with models of galaxy formation? And something that is, I'll, I'll come back to later, is the fact that galaxies align locally through tidal interactions and that gets all screwed up by, by merging, et cetera. And so we're having a hard time predicting that up in issue. But again, Euclid will allow us to measure this with far uh, better precision. And this is where these accurate shape measurements from Euclid really play a key role, because especially the first point um, with Rubin, you can't do it. And the scaling relations is basically an example how with targeted 
sort of stacking, Euclid can measure the masses of pretty much an ensemble average mass that is, but the ensemble averages masses of objects with error bars that are basically limited by the sample sizes themselves. So really the issue of measuring the masses of clusters, Euclid solves that, right? So it, the, the, the challenge is really combining it to the variance. But including these small scales is really important. Uh, this is again from this overview paper. And I think the important point to, to compare is because this is the pessimistic case and the optimistic case. So this is basically the scenario where we assume that in the next years, we're not making any progress. And this is, I think, what Euclid you should exceed. And, and the main point is to compare to the yellow bars. You see that by going to these smaller scales, we can improve the measurements much, much better, right? So it's really worthwhile to probe these small scales where Euclid can do things. And we can, right? So I've been arguing with, with people in the consortium because we're designing a survey and, and do all this work on systematics, and then you would throw away 60% of your constraining power, then why are we launching this in the first place, right? We should be focusing on that. And we can, because we can see the effects of feedback when we look at the gas fractions of groups of galaxies. Material gets blown out because here the gravitational potential is weaker than in massive clusters. And the AGN feedback is almost the same. And you see they're losing much of the material. And you can turn this into model predictions. So this is a simple halo model prediction that allowed us to sort of say, okay, where are the uncertainties? And we find that the real issue is constraining where do the baryons end up? So we need to really start probing the outskirts of these uh, group halos. So that can be done with Erosita, or at least the data has been collected so far, as Z service. So there's a lot of data coming to probe this. Um, and that will then, help us to improve the models. I already mentioned the intrinsic alignment. So there's also, right, the, the, the lensing effect, it causes an apparent alignment, right? The galaxies themselves didn't change. We just see them distorted. But two galaxies close together, they feel each other's gravity and they will tend to align. So for instance, here's a big galaxy, the galaxies around it will point towards it. Whereas these distant galaxies are gravitational lens, so they are stretched tangentially. And that causes correlations or anti-correlations in this case uh, that depend on redshift. So things are different, redshifts are coupled. And it depends on galaxy formation. But again, we can measure this. So we've done this with the kilo degree survey. And we see that, yeah, when we look at, at the satellite galaxies, we find that the effect is actually quite small, but we can measure this. And with Euclid, the error bars will be order of magnitude smaller. And we have yet to detect alignments for blue galaxies. And then you can go a step further because current models, they marginalize over this. Oh, we don't know anything about intrinsic alignments. We have some, some simple model. We'll just leave everything free. And again, they give up constraining power, but worse, we've actually shown they're using the wrong model. So marginalization is nice, but marginalizing with the wrong model is still a bad idea. Um, but instead, what you should be doing, just like Pop already said, right? Go and measure it. Don't, don't say, oh, I'm ignorant about this. No, then you should measure things. And that's what we've tried to do. So we, again, use the kids data, combine it with other measurement. And that led actually to a very interesting result where, because most previous results were focused on this high mass thing, as we're pushing to lower masses, we're seeing that the alignments uh, are flattening off. But this is the difference. With these models, we can predict for any survey the amount of alignment. And again, with better measurements, we can do this better and better. And interestingly, these predictions are typically, well, they're more precise than what you get from the cosmology, and they actually give you very useful information if you want to measure cosmological parameters. So that's something we want to do. And then ultimately, because so far, we focus mostly on two-point statistics, of course, we want to go much further, and, and really the only reasonable way or tractable way to do that is to emulate the whole universe. And then and then link this to these observations. So there's again, a, a huge progress in the hydro simulations in particular people in, in Leiden, Matthias Schaller and Yorkshire. And so this is really what I'm 
arguably, of course, you, the, the cosmological parameters are, are important, but what I'm really interested in is using Euclid to sort of, well, not keep running around in, in circles, but use Euclid to get the masses and constrain the astrophysics to inform the simulations and the simulations then help us to better interpret the observations. And once we hopefully loop once or twice, we actually can simulate the act, a universe that is consistent with this exquisite Euclid data and extract much more cosmological information and galaxy formation in, uh, from, the, from the Euclid data. And so, so I think it's, it's gonna be a tremendous data set, um, but still a lot of work needs to be done. So the current ground-based survey like KITS um, uh, have played an important role. We've learned a tremendous amount. We realized how naive we were or how ignorant we were, um, but we're really getting at a level where we can really finish this up. And so Euclid is well suited to do this. I would say there's no showstopper to date. We just need a rocket. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for this wonderful journey through Euclid. So um, time for questions. We have five minutes roughly for questions. So we'll first take questions from the audience. I see there's um, somebody with a raised hand there, please. Hello, hello. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, you showed the uh, Eagle simulations. And uh, for, I don't know, the past 15 years, people have talked about uh, Lambda CDM over predicting small structure. Is, is a legitimate conclusion from those Eagle simulations that this problem is no longer there because of AGN feedback now correctly being put into the simulation? Uh, so I think the small scale problem is, is more likely supernova physics. So the AGN is really used to solve the, the say, underabundance of extremely bright galaxies. Whereas at the low mass end, we don't think these low mass galaxies have AGN, but star formation, you know, like stars blowing up can have a big impact. Um, so that definitely plays a role, right? Because when they tune this to match observations uh, that improve things. But of course, there's a lot of open questions still also on that. So I think that that is something Euclid will also address. Uh, maybe Leon will talk about it with strong lensing will help a lot on probing the substructure. So I think that the, the feedback goes a long way, but again, many details um, yeah, remain to be studied. So you don't think the feedback goes all the way? The problem has not been solved then? I, I don't know. I don't, let's put it like, I don't know if it's been solved, but it's also not clear there is a problem. So it's a, it's a bit, uh, I think there's different sides to that. Thank you. Any more questions? Here in the front. First row, yeah. This is a very exciting work. And uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is very exciting work. I wonder with this, these very large amounts of data, is the community applying um, various, you know, fancy machine learning techniques to this data to look for patterns that are unexpected and and uh, haven't been seen? Yeah, there are people uh, thinking of that. And, and indeed you see machine learning coming in, uh, yeah, becoming more prominent also in some of the emulation, of course, plays a very important role. Um, but yeah, that's, that's exactly the challenge now, because as you know, with machine learning, garbage in, garbage out. And that's where really this emphasis on accuracy is. So I think the first step is really making sure that we understand the data extremely well. And I think that is what is, well, the CMB uh, Planck played an important role. And we hope that Euclid can play a similarly important role that we can sort of say, okay, you can look for something strange because we can guarantee it's not the data, right? Whereas now with some of the, the, the issues, right? We, we see also slight difference with Planck, right? At the same time, you're like, okay, the super exciting, but are we really sure it's not the data? And I think that is something Euclid will really help. But then I think once we are sure of that, 
then it's going to be exciting also indeed to explore more extreme uh, or alternatives. I think um, we should move on to the next speaker. I don't know if maybe while the next speaker sets up, if there's any more question or maybe there was something in the chat. I don't know if we can see it. If there is a question. There's nothing online. Okay. Then I think we can thank. Uh, oh, there's a question. Okay. One quick question. To one question: How far Euclid will see in space? Um, yeah, so <laughs> actually pretty far, um, but it's 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 a specific. Uh, so I focus mostly on the lensing bit, but to to be able to measure the distances very well, we also do a phenomenal near infrared survey and also the spectroscopy of the infrared. And so we expect to discover redshift eight. We're almost guaranteed to discover redshift eight quasars. So we almost as long as we launch quick enough, we'll find the first redshift eight quasars because they're extremely rare. So you need to look at a large part of the sky. Uh, so that, I would say that's sort of the most distant individual objects we'll, we'll, we'll discover. So you go up to redshift eight? Yeah, but those are extreme objects. But our typical galaxy, so for the image you showed, the mean redshift is about one. Oh, I see. So it's rather well limited in the cosmic standards. A web, web telescope is doing better, you know. Okay, okay. maybe a very quick uh, answer. Yeah, so to that's this. where Roman, so the Roman Space Telescope aims, that's on infrared telescope. So that aims to go deeper more than, than okay. white. Okay. Yeah. Good okay. luck. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, let's thank Hank again.